Hello. Thank you for coming to our talk despite the storm. So this talk is going to be about a strange event that occurred in the basement of the Guardian office in London in the summer of 2013, where the Guardian were instructed by GCHQ to destroy laptops containing the Snowden files. So I'm going to be talking for 15 minutes, and Richie is going to be talking for 15 minutes, and we're going to open up to Q&A. So when I usually talk about this subject, I usually start by mentioning and describing who Edward Snowden is, but I don't really think I need to for this audience. So a bit of background. The Guardian was one of the newspapers that had access to some of the raw copies of the Snowden files. And of course, they had to take great measures to actually protect those files and make sure that they don't fall into the wrong hands, like GCHQ. Yeah. So some of the security measures they took was that, of course, they stored the files on an encrypted hard drive. And they also air grabbed the machines to make sure that there's no internet connection and nothing, no signals can get, get in and out. And it was actually a secure room where no one was allowed to take in the device that had any internet connectivity. So you had to leave all your devices outside and go into the room to make sure that there's no way that information can digi digitally leave the room. And of course, the British government wasn't actually happy about the fact that the Guardian was releasing the files from the intelligence agency. So as a result, the cabinet secretary pressured the Guardian to return the documents. And the reason why they wanted to do this, according to the National Security Advisor, was to conduct forensics, presumably to strengthen the legal case against Edward Snowden, for example, to figure out which files he had actually taken and how many files, and also possibly to strengthen the legal case against the Guardian and the reporters who viewed the files and reported on the files. Initially, the Guardian ignored the threats and didn't take them seriously. But the harassment continued. And Hayward, who's the cabinet secretary, said, we can do this nicely or, go, or we can go to the law. A lot of people in government think you should be closed down. And the national security advisor said, if you won't return it, we will have to talk to other people this evening. And I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds something from the Russian mafia rather than the, a, a British government. So in order to protect, protect the documents, the Guardian decided that it can't continue reporting on the documents from its London offices because the, th the threats were too much. So they said that they would destroy the documents in its, Lo in its London office, and, but continue to report on the documents from other locations. However, GCHG wanted to actually inspect the material before it was destroyed, destroy it themselves, and take back the pieces, which is pretty weird. And the Guardian said, no, we can't have that. So the mutual agreement they came up with was that the Guardian would destroy the documents themselves, but GCHQ would supervise them in doing so and tell them exactly how to destroy it, presumably because GCHQ did not trust the Guardian to destroy it properly. So the Guardian was instructed to buy an entire shopping list of destruction equipment, ankle grinders, dremels, and masks. And GCHQ also provided their own degausser because that was too expensive. And GCHQ in, supervised the entire instruction process and guided the Guardian on how to destroy the laptops and which chips to destroy. And in addition to that, two GCHQ technical experts recorded the entire process on their iPhones. So this is a video of parts of the destruction process. So about six months after that, we actually went to the Guardian to try and see what we could learn about how GCHQ supervised the Guardian in the destruction process, because potentially there could be quite a lot to learn about from GCHQ about how to properly eradicate a device. Maybe there's things that they know about our devices that we don't. 
Because the interesting thing was that many non-obvious components on the device were destroyed, including components in the keyboard, trackpad, and the battery controller, which is pretty strange because normally people would just destroy the hard drive rather than components, other, other components on the machine. So this is a before and after picture of the trackpad controller that was destroyed. And you can see here uh, the red chip highlighted in red was destroyed. And that turned out to be an actual, actually a serial flash chip that can store up to two megabits of memory. And you can see here that the yellow and orange chips were left intact. And it turns out that there's a lot of chips on your machine that can store data. For example, even your trackpad has, can actually have a firmware update. And in fact, even your battery controller has a, can have firmware, and you can get firmware ba updates for your battery controller if you've got a Mac. So this is a sort of concept taken from a Dan, Dan Kaminsky talk in DEF CON. And it's called Zibit's Iron Law of Computer Architecture. And it basically states that the biggest lie about your computer is that it's just one computer. Because in fact, your computer is actually many computers all networked together. And each of those computers have its own firmware, and as a consequence, their own storage. And you know, a lot of people say, well, what if GCHQ is just this spreading misinformation? What if they just told the Guardian to destroy all these random chips just to mess with our minds? And you know, it, it could, be, it sounds, at first it sounds like a um, credible theory, because GCHQ have this group called the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group. Where, and it says the scope of JCHQ's mission includes using dirty tricks to destroy, deny, degrade, and disrupt enemies by discrediting them, planting misinformation, and shutting down their communications. And one of the Guardian staff members said that it was purely a symbolic act. We knew that, JCHQ knew that, and the government knew that. But the real question I think here is, I think it probably was a symbolic act from a political standpoint. But was it a symbolic act from a technical standpoint? Because GCHQ are still bound to government bureaucracy, and the government, the British government has a whole bunch of documents that outline how they should destroy, properly eradicate information. And the other thing that's worth noting here is that GCHQ didn't actually intend for the destruction process to be public. Initially, they just wanted to have a copy of the, of the files so that they can conduct forensics on them. So was GCHQ spelling this information? Maybe, but even if they were, the evidence suggests that there actually there are potentially valid reasons for destroying these chips. So after we published our original post, we had a number of comments that we can't validate, but they do have some interesting theories that seem that could be valid. So one of the first comment was, back when I worked for Apple, slash Converges, one of the main things was that we could not bring in our own peripherals to use, mice, keyboard, etc. The issue is that one, in theory, could customize it for storage covertly and copy customer client information, which uh, that does make sense because these chips have firmware updates. You can actually update their firmware from your computer, so you could actually put information on these chips. And another person who works in data destruction or claim to says that I have destroyed the brand new iDevices of senior government personnel because they plugged it into a classified network to charge it for less than a minute. The law is the law. I actually had a wall of digital devices we drilled, degauss, etc. So what is the law regarding destruction? So this doc there's a document from the British government called Government Security Classifications that defines top secret and its threat model. And from that, they, can, they derive how top secret information should be destroyed. So here, top secret information is defined as Her Majesty's most sensitive information requiring the highest level of protection from the most serious threats. For example, where compromise could cause widespread loss of life else or else threaten the security of or economic well-being of the country or friendly nations. And this is another document created by the Communications Electronic Security Group, which is a group within GCHQ that advises, the, that advises governmental organizations how to maintain their electronic security. And here they've got a flowchart on how they actually prioritize and re present risks depending on the threats. So in step two, you've got identify and assess threat sources, and in step four, you've got identify and assess threat actors. 
So based on the top secret classification, what are the top secret, what are the threats for actors and sources? And it's also defined in that document too. It says the threat profile for top secret reflects the highest level of capability deployed against the nation's most sensitive information and services. It is assumed that advanced state actors will prioritize compromising this category of information or services using significant technical, financial, and human resources over extended period of, periods of time. Highly bespoke and targeted attacks may be deployed, blending human sources and actions with non-technical attacks. Very little information risk can be tolerated, which I think begs the question, well, what highly bespoke and targeted attacks can be deployed against this? And you could also look at the Snowden leaks. So the NSA have this catalog of, of hardware implants that they can put into all sorts of places on, on the machine. So this is, a, this is a one type of hardware implant that they can put into a keyboard that basically allows them to illuminate the keyboard with the radar or your machine with radar. And your, your, the, this, the keyboard chip will reflect the key, your keystrokes. So it's essentially a keylogger hardware implant. Although in this particular situation, this is information is being exfiltrated uh, and not stored on the device. So it wouldn't make sense to destroy the device in this, this way for this particular hardware implant. But it's not hard to be creative and think of what other, that there could be other hardware implants that do actually store the information temporarily on the device itself for collection after. So there are two documents that I know of that counter government that govern counter compromise measures. There's the HMG Information Insurance Note Five, which is a data destruction standard used by the British government. Uh, this, is, this isn't a public document, but I emailed just here to ask for it because you know who knows maybe if you ask nicely they will give it to you for a change. But of course they refused because their policy is that this document is only available to UK public sector organisations. But funnily enough, at the end of the email, they said they stated communications with DCSQ may be monitored and or recorded for system efficiency and other lawful purposes. So at least they're nice enough to tell me this time that they're surveilling us. And the other document was the Joint Service Publication 440, which is a 2000 page restricted manual by the Ministry of Defense. Unfortunately, that was leaked by WikiLeaks a few years ago. It contains a table that describes how you should destroy different types of chips, depending on how sensitive the information is. So you've got the baseline standard and the enhanced standard. The enhanced standard is for more sensitive information. So for EP-ROM, for example, you've got uh, chip erase and then overwrite, uh, can't read that, overwrite or destroy, which is what they did particularly here they incinerated the ships. Funnily enough, this document also has a paragraph that describes uh, what the security measures are, are aimed for. And it says the security measures in this chapter are aimed primarily to cover contracts made in CSSRAs that have been drawn up to protect the individual from action by FISs, extremist groups, investigative journalists, and criminals. So they tell investigative journalists and criminals in the same group. Um, so, as Mustafa said, we couldn't get hold of all the documents that we needed to be able to figure out what they were actually doing. Uh, but we wanted to find if there was any other documents which would explain how they were operating, why they were operating the way they were. And so, we went and had a look at all the Five Eyes countries, and it turns out that all but the UK make very public the uh, procedure that they would use in order to actually destroy information. The first slide here talks about sanitization. And there's a very interesting point here that no matter what you do to a hard drive, according to GCHQ, once that, that hard drive, that piece of hardware contained top secret information, it always remained top secret because there was no effective way, in their words, that it was almost, it was almost, uh, it was difficult or impossible to totally sanitize. And I think that's very interesting from the fact that we all have these devices ourselves, 
and in some cases we may actually need to delete some very, very sensitive information. So what we did was we had a look at uh, the five eyes and I've picked out what I think are the relevant components from each one of their manuals for how they go about destroying hardware and I'll just go through some of them now. But it's important to see here that they have, uh, they make a distinction between volatile storage, for example RAM, and also for um, hard drives. They then go on to explain um, what are the permissible destruction methods for the individual type of material. And I've highlighted here the, uh, the grinder cutting and degausser section. And some of the interesting things are that for some semiconductor memory, none of them are actually relevant for the destruction. Um, moving on to the actual meat of what destruction means to these type of agencies, um, for things like USB sticks and uh, memory and various other things that store information, they require that after the process, the size of the individual bits of dust must be less than a particular size. Because if they were bigger, they would potentially, an adversary would, be, would potentially be able to recover the information from even the bits that were left. And as you can see here, that a material or a, a, a electronic device that contained top secret material that was shredded, but that each component was greater than 12 millimeters, still retained the classification of secret. So even going to the 12 millimeter uh, standard, in their eyes, wasn't sufficient because we think they themselves would have been able to recover information from such a device. And if you look further over to the left of, the, um, of the, the table there, you can see that only when the dust was less than or equal to three millimeters would it be considered properly and adequately destroyed. Um, as Mustafa said, the, uh, the whole process in The Guardian was supervised by uh, two agents. And interestingly enough, the Five Eyes um, manual for, or some of the Five Eyes countries manuals for how to destroy information requires that two agents must be present with top secret security clearance if the information that they're going to be destroying is top secret. And this seems to resonate quite closely with what we actually saw in GCHQ, two agents coming in to supervise the destruction. There's some more interesting bits when you look at things like uh, volatile memory such as RAM. And the, there's an interesting line where it says that every, most people might think that if, if you had RAM, you power it off in about 30 seconds, it'd be very, very difficult to extract information from it. There's plenty of people, forensic guys, who would then freeze it in nitrogen, which might actually buy them some more time. However, if you see here that when you have an operating system that stores cryptographic keys in memory, in the same location in memory, you can get what's called burn-in of the key. And even after the power is removed, some of those cryptographic keys could be recovered. And so as part of their threat model, the GCHQ were, were I suppose, thinking that what happens if China or Russia got a hold of this material after it was destroyed and were potentially able to get back the cryptographic keys that might have been used to encrypt the, uh, or that could have been used to decrypt the uh, material on the drives. The second thing is that uh, even your hard drive, non-volatile uh, storage, also has um, areas where no matter what you do, there is pretty much uh, information always going to be retained in individual chips. And I'd just like to show you now the reflection of this in the actual devices that they destroyed. So this is what they did to four RAM sticks. You can see that one, two, three, four, they're in horizontal. It's a bit difficult to make out, but based on the fact that the, mem the, memory, could have, the memory could have contained uh, some of the, the cryptographic keys, uh, this is what they felt they had to do in order to keep their information secure from anybody who may have got hold of these, uh, these components. And in relation to the hard drive, they not only went after the platters that were internal within the hard drive, they also went after certain chips on the hard drive itself. 
and I don't know if we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this later on, but some researchers have shown, I think it was the equation group, where they showed how malware could store information in these individual chips from the operating system, which may potentially have allowed recovery of that information later on by a third party or a fourth party in this case. And this is what they did to the individual platters within the hard drives. They degauss them and then went over them with drills. Um, there are many more components that I hope I have time to, uh, to show you. Um, but there's another interesting thing here when it talks about flash memory. And it basically says that no matter what you do again, they must always remain at the individual classification for, uh, uh, or depending on what the information was contained on the device originally. So top secret remains top secret. Um, they also, I've, I've put in the slides here to show the, the, the mirror between what New Zealand state and what now the Australian state in terms of how they destroy information or how they determine destruction of top secret information ought to be carried out. And finally, we have Canada and the USA. USA has a very big document uh, up on crypto, uh, which you can read yourself, which goes into what proper destruction of documents or of um, uh, components should be. And they mirror very, very closely, if not exactly, all the other documentation that we were able to find from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and now the USA. And Canada has the same uh, two mil millimeter edge length for um, secure information or for top secret information. We were also able to find um, information of companies who provide uh, outsourced destruction of these types of devices. And even though, as Mustafa said, we were refused access to what the British government will say is required, many of the companies actually state what is in IA5. So if you look at the, I think it's the third, the last line, where they talk about reducing things down to the particle size of six millimeters or two millimeters, and that resonates quite clearly with the Australian, New Zealand, and Canada, and USA side of things. So it's very, very interesting that the, the, the other four eyes are willing to publish the, the sanitization and destruction procedure, but the UK isn't. I just thought that was quite interesting. So moving on to what the actual uh, keyboard controller that was done to it, um, in, in, from, from people we spoke to, this can retain some information about what keys you press, which may contain passwords, or which may contain passphrases that could be used to unlock private keys. So if somebody got their hands on that, they might be able to figure out what the, uh, or what the passphrases might be for, um, for the keys. Mustafa went through uh, the trackpad controller, and this is the full smashed up trackpad of uh, a MacBook Air uh, 13 inch. And zooming in on the bottom, as he said, there's a chip. I hope you guys can see that. It's on the, le it's on the right hand side, and they drilled out specifically this chip where both the keyboard and mouse goes through uh, this chip and, and it can store up to two megabytes of information. Bits. And, oh, sorry? Megabits. Two megabits of information, thanks. And um, that's quite a lot of information. And if somebody had entered in various different bits or various different passwords again, this might be the place where an adversary could recover those, uh, those passwords that were entered in. As you'll see later on, there's people who have contacted us with theories about malware, which you know you can you can you can accept them if you want. But there are, there are many theories which we'll we'll look at later on. The other interesting thing they did was they destroyed the battery controllers of all the Apple MacBook Airs that had um, that had top secret documents on them, and they were very specific. This is just one, but all three of them were destroyed in exactly the same way. This is the front side. And as you can see on the left, there was one specific chip that was destroyed. And we've seen some recent research where people have been able to derive uh, what you're doing based on power usage. And if this chip was potentially recording information, in theory, you might be able to recover what the user was doing on the laptop just based on the power draw, the historical power draw over a period of time. And this is the front side. So the, the, again, this chip, which is just on the left-hand side, and I just put a 5P coin so that you guys could see the scale of what we're talking about. And they were very precise. They came in with their shopping list and said, drill this chip, turn it over, drill that chip. Um, 
some of the other ways in which uh, uh, we've seen from the trade shows that, that we, we sneak into, there are um, uh, hardware vendors which will sell big shredders where you can put entire machines in. The Guardian wouldn't let them do that. And so, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time we've had a laptop with, containing top secret information that was sanitized by GCHQ and has been left in the public domain. They were also interested in, in, a, in, a, in a component called an inverting converter. Again, this is rela in relation to, to power. And many people were stumped by why they would actually go for this specific piece. And again, of the three laptops that were destroyed, they destroyed this on all of them. Um, it can contain, I think, up to 256 kilobits of information. And again, that might be able to be used to, to recover what was actually been done on the laptop uh, and depending on how Apple uh, used that chip because in reality we simply don't know uh, how that chip was configured on that circuit board what information went through it and Apple were not very forthcoming in telling us uh, what the chips actually did. This is what they did to the CPU. Uh, they simply cut it in half. They didn't do any more, uh, uh, any further destruction in terms of turning it to dust. Um, but so if you guys have a CPU containing information that, um, or you have a machine containing information that you don't want somebody to be able to recover that, this might be a good idea to do. Um, the next was the SSD. Uh, and the SSD, as you'll see later on, there's been some people who've been doing research on uh, malware for SSDs and where you can store information. And basically they went through and destroyed every single component that was on the SSD. This is not as interesting because I think most people, if they thought they had to get rid of information in a hurry, if they, they were a journalist source or a journalist, and there was a knock at the door, I'm sure the SSD or the hard drive would be the very first thing people would think of to put in the fire or to, to do something uh, to get rid of it. In terms of USB sticks, which I think probably everybody in this room has, and maybe everybody in this room has had information on a USB stick which they wouldn't want to fall into the wrong hands. Um, we'll go on later on to show what they say about USB sticks, but they're almost impossible to adequately sanitize. Um, so if you're transferring information around on USB sticks, it may be a good idea to completely destroy it afterwards if it's a matter of life and death. And we'll go on and talk about um, the kind of threat models that some of our partners face in Latin America and uh, Africa. Again, just to show the consistency in, in the way they were operating, this wasn't a, a, a random thing where they went in and just destroyed random chips on each uh, USB stick. This is a different model of USB. I'm sorry, this is a little bit blurry. My camera skills uh, are not the best. And so when I took that picture, obviously it didn't come out too well. But I hope you can see that uh, every single bit well, every single chip on that USB stick was completely removed. And in the next uh, slide, you'll actually see what they did to every single chip that they removed from the devices. They turned them into very, very small, uh, very close to dust. And you can see how the uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and US uh, regulations for how you adequately destroy uh, hardware that has contained um, top secret information is reflected in, in this slide in particular. So I just want to recap a little bit on, on some of these things that unfortunately I didn't have time to go through all the other bits. There was HP monitors that were destroyed uh, and we're working to, with, with people to try and figure out any of the other components, what their storage capabilities were, how, how it would be possible to maybe put information into the chip that maybe wouldn't happen in, in normal operation, maybe with malware or maybe through a fault in the operating system. But one of the things that I think is kind of important is that GCHQ don't seem to trust Apple with their top secrets. So maybe we shouldn't. I mean, if these uh, laptops contained information that were a matter of life and death for an activist in Uganda, Nigeria or Colombia, and they absolutely had to get rid of this information. Unfortunately, it seems like this might be something they could consider. And it's difficult to know where just pressing the delete key 
secure arrays and actual physical destruction, where is the uh, practical solution dependent upon the risk? In some cases, obviously, maybe delete if it's just your, your recipes or your family photos, but in other cases, it's a little bit unclear about what you may actually have to do to delete information from your, uh, from your machines. Um, and, and the thing here is we, we have a roadmap for the components. We know that any component that could have contained top secret information needed to be pulverized to, to a, a square that was three millimeters by three millimeters. And that's public for the five, for the four eyes. But what happens in relation to a Dell or a Lenovo laptop, Dell laptop? We don't have a roadmap for all the components in these computers that can contain that information. And we're trying to, through FOI, uh, try to figure out how they found the information out from Apple, what they actually did, and if there's any more information that they can give us um, about other models of computers. I'm not sure how successful it will be because GCHQ are exempt from freedom of information. This is a, a thing from Chris Sagoin, who mentioned it to me last night who said what they actually should have done, as you can see, when the Terminator needed to be destroyed and all his circuitry needed to be destroyed, they simply put it into a very hot molten lava pit. Um, in reality, this is probably what they should have done. But as I said earlier on, the Guardian wouldn't let that happen. They wanted to keep the laptops. They did the destruction themselves. It wasn't GCHQ doing it. It was uh, the Guardian employees acting on the instructions of precisely which chip to destroy. So after this, we decided to contact some of the uh, companies. Um, Dell was quite interesting because we contacted them about their keyboards. And they were very reluctant um, to tell us anything about what their keyboard circuitry would do. And they said that it was Dell confidential information. So it seems a bit weird that you know we have this patent system where companies can actually engage in innovation and they get a monopoly on, on the innovations that they, that they do for somewhere from 10 to 20 years, depending on which country you're in. But the corollary of that, or the, the other side of that, is by getting the patent, they also have to make it public. So it seems like we're not getting the best of both worlds. They can be completely non-transparent around what their devices do, but still get the confidential patents and keep the, what, their, what their devices do incredibly secret and not have to tell us how we might be at risk or how their devices might betray us. Um, HP was another very weird one. Um, so we were in the process, we actually had a very good dialogue, many back and forth pieces of information or very uh, good back and forth um, emails. And then one day we got an email that had in really, really bold letters underlined confidential. And there was a two lines in there saying that we needed to engage in this very uh, uh, confidential process. Um, and I responded to say, well, I'm not doing this for the goodness of my own health. I mean, I am curious. I'm extremely curious about what they were doing, why they picked those chips, and what other chips in computers would be, could potentially betray us with uh, information that we might want to get rid of. And after I said, listen, this is, this is, this needs to be a transparent process. We're going to make everything you guys say to us public. Communication stopped. And that was very, very disappointing because um, you know, we thought we were actually going to get somewhere and maybe get some information from them about how their devices uh, behaved. But we certainly didn't want to, at Privacy International, we didn't want that information just residing in my head. It's no use in my head. We wanted to share it with the public so the wider public could know if an individual component could contain information that they might want to lead, might want to lead it. So, as Mustafa said, we, uh, we were contacted with some very, very elaborate theories. Um, and some of, them are, some of them are good, some of them are a bit out there. Um, I'll leave it to you guys to maybe uh, see which one you think is best. And maybe throughout the course of tonight or tomorrow, you can come to us and maybe give us your own theories. No theory is necessarily invalid and may actually be the right one. Um, so some people thought this was purely a, a symbolic show of power. And they went in and just acted completely randomly. 
and just said, we're going to destroy random chips here, random chips there, and that was essentially it. Um, while that may be so, they destroyed the same chips on all the same computers, the, the MacBook Airs, so there seemed to be some um, reason or motivation or, or logic behind what they were doing. And many of the chips, in fact, most of the chips that they were, were destroying would have contained things like firmware, which could have been updated by uh, the operating system or um, could have been updated via other means. Uh, and some people contacted us to say, we're being idiots. I mean, this is, this is obvious. I've been working in the security community for many years. And when I, had inf when I had laptops with top secret information on it, these, this is exactly what I did. But again, this is only specifically for the MacBook Air. This is not for any of the other laptops that I see most people around here seem to have Lenovo laptops. What do we do with them? And where can that information be, uh, be stored? Uh, some of the other, uh, again, further out there ones were that GCHQ were actually destroying traces of malware that they themselves had inserted and that were in many of the Guardian computers uh, for quite a while and that they were just going in and destroying so that there was no evidence of what they had put there. I'm not saying that's right. Uh, I'll leave it to yourselves to, to see if you think that resonates with you. Um, they were also removing things where they thought other states may have put malware or malware on the machine may have been able to dump the sensitive files into these chips so that if the Guardian subsequently disposed of them in five years or whatever, that the adversary could come in and uh, recover the information from the chips if they weren't destroyed in accordance with the procedure that we saw in uh, some of the documents. And again, as I said, if you guys have any theories, I'd love to hear them. Um, so why is this important? Uh, I think from a privacy perspective, we need to um, empower users with knowledge about what their devices do, where they store the information, and more importantly, when we want to destroy our information, we should have a right to actually destroy it and be sure it's gone. And for most, well, when I was going through my IT training in university, it was like I thought the delete key was enough. And then I found out that, well, actually, the delete key is not enough because it doesn't erase things from the hard drive. And then you use things like secure arrays. So in theory, that information should be gone. But as we saw from the uh, manuals from Australia and New Zealand and the USA, they can actually recover information from it even after that process has been, uh, has been conducted. And we also need verification tools so that we know that firmware that comes from or that's on our machines actually comes from the vendor so that if Apple or Lenovo or anybody else wants to be complicit in this kind of surveillance, um, they're going to have to backdoor those things and they're going to have to sign them with very strong crypt cryptographic keys so that I can in some way verify that all firmware on my machine actually came from where I think it came from and that it hasn't been altered in any way. And as we've seen some of the, the latest research, we've seen things like Thunderstrike 2, um, where it can infect the, the bootloader and potentially insert malware into the operating system before it loads. I mentioned earlier, you've got things like Equation Group, where they were able to infect um, the uh, hard drive controllers themselves to potentially then uh, alter files as they were uh, read from the, the hard drive. And finally, um, Karsten Null, who I think presented here on the first night on SS7, he was also involved in, I hope people here will remember the thing of uh, bad USB, where using a specific USB, you could, you could flash the firmware and do some pretty funky things with a USB device um, and then give it to other people and potentially infect them. We're in Germany at the moment, and when we conducted this, we were in uh, the UK. For many people around the world, um, deletion of their information is a matter of life and death. Uh, many activists have very, very sensitive information that can lead to them being in trouble or any of their sources. And in some cases, they have to get rid of the information. And I really don't want to have to advise them that the only way to be sure to get rid of this information is to actually start taking out an angle grinder to a very expensive laptop that they probably got a grant for and then are left with nothing afterwards. 
we ought to be able to have verifiable deletion of our information and know that that information is gone because the consequences there can be highly, highly uh, damaging. So I'll finish off with some of the open questions. Um, again, this talk was, unfortunately, if people came here expecting answers, um, I think the work that we've done so far has thrown up more questions than answers. And if any of you in the audience can answer these for us, it would be really, really helpful because um, as long as you're willing to, to, to have us make that public, um, I think people ought to know the, the full extent of the information that's on their laptop and where it's contained and when they want to get rid of it. What do they do? Um, as, at a more fundamental level, uh, do we have a right to delete our information? And if we do, and if people in the room believe we do have a right to information, then we ought to be able to know exactly where it's stored and to have verifiable ways of, just, of going into each one of these chips and ensuring that any information that's contained in there that could uh, cause us damage um, is in fact deleted. Um, do we own our devices or are devices uh, essentially primed to betray us? And what can we do moving forward so that we don't have to go to the extreme length that GCHQ went through to ensure that documents uh, that were leaked to them didn't fall into the wrong hands? So I wish I had more time to go through some of the other photos, but we needed to keep it uh, within time. Uh, we're going to be releasing some of the other uh, photos and some analyses of uh, the various different components over the, the next few months. Um, and I hope if anybody has information, uh, specific information about the components or a similar component, you might like to get in touch. And feel free to get in touch over Twitter, because as I said, this process is very public. No theory is too outlandish, too weird. Uh, feel free to voice it uh, so that it may be the right one and it may be, so, it may be a missing piece of the puzzle that we've missed and we'd love to hear uh, what you guys think. So thanks very much for coming back in spite of the rain and thanks very much to the guys here for getting the, the setup back so quickly. It was absolutely amazing. And if you have any questions, uh, be willing to take them now. Before we take questions, just a quick update. Um, the plans have changed slightly. The next talk, TLS interception considered harmful, is not going to happen today. It was moved to tomorrow at 12.45 in this tent. So now we actually do have 20 more minutes. So if you want to show pictures, okay. just go ahead. You have 20 more minutes if you want. I don't have them here. I only put them in the slides. OK. Well, we'll take the questions. OK, then we just go straight to Q&A. There's mics there and there. Just line up at the mics if you do have any questions. Um, we'll, I'll just tell you when to talk. Right. No questions. Oh, we have one. Stage right, please. That's you. Yeah. I think the audio is not on yet. Stage right. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for the talk. Um, just on the um, point about the, um, the battery um, uh, monitoring uh, chips, so I have a little bit of familiarity with these, and I don't think that they would be necessarily um, backing much history, if at all, because that, that's not really what they are kind of designed to do. They're, they're um, learning about the... Uh, things like the internal resistance to the battery, open circuit voltage and things like that. However, they do have lots and lots of space for things like uh, authentication keys and things like that. So you could store stuff in there um, if you wanted to put it somewhere where it, it wouldn't be found. It found, found it easily. Okay? Cool. Thank you very much. Please, um, stage left, please. Okay, I don't have a question, but possibly it's also a question. Um, I would say it's pretty obvious that they're not going about malware or anything. Of course, it could also be, we don't know. But they were simply trying to destroy all the chips where Ed Snowden would have been able to store some information in. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, by, not by accident or by history or by keys being recorded, but in, uh, intentionally have stored hidden information. I, it looks like they destroyed basically everything where you can store stuff in. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I don't think it's very likely that they destroyed these ships because they had malware in it. I think they destroyed it exactly because of what you said, because they could have, they could store information. So but I, I don't. Yeah, I, I would not be afraid that my battery or my trackpad controller records everything I do in a usual day use of my computer. Of course, that might be if the NSA has prepared it. But basically, that I can store things there if I want to, and they expected Ed possibly did that. Yeah, yeah. You, you can store actually information on the battery because you can get you can update the firmware of the battery, and you can also store sensitive information there. But I think that the reason why they destroyed all of these chips isn't necessarily because they had they knew that Edward Snowden could have or has the, the information there. I think it was purely a bureaucratic reason. They were doing so because they did they had to do that to every single device because they have to uh, take precautionary method, measures. And because yeah. there is the potential, and they have to do this for uh, top secret material so absolutely if it could have stored information there either intentionally I, I guess one of the things that or one of the, the, the theories that that we were working off initially was that um, it may have stored information there simply by the ordinary run-of-the-mill operation of the Apple device and the unique thing with uh, an Apple device obviously is they control the hardware and the software so we were actually in a good position to try and ask Apple well, you're the ones with the schematics for the motherboard. You're the ones who bought the chip. You know exactly what that chip does, what information goes through there, and what information can be stored there just through normal operation, not because somebody might have stored other information there. And that was one of the theories we were working off. But absolutely take the point that it could have been uh, uh, an intentional storage of secret information there that they may have wanted to get rid of. Stage right, please. That's you. Yes. Wasn't it useless to destroy the laptop? All the information could have been moved somewhere on the net. Sorry, I didn't get the first part of that question. Can you repeat? So, wasn't it pointless to destroy the laptop? Every, all the information could have been moved somewhere on the internet. I'm so, so is, is, is your question, why did they destroy the laptop? Yes. Well, so when they went in, they had to destroy it because it contained top secret information. Oh, I think your question was, why did they destroy it if it was already on the internet, was yes. it? Um, all the information could still exist somewhere. Oh, oh, and it did exist. We knew it was in New York, or they knew it was in New yeah. York as well. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Uh, GCHQ knew um, that copies of the information existed elsewhere. So I'm pretty sure they knew when they, was, they, went, when they were destroying these documents, it would have no impact of reporting. And I think that's another, question, that's another uh, topic for debate, because it is, a, it is a pretty pointless act, and it was a symbolic act. But I think the likely reason for that was bureaucracy. GCHU just had, just had to follow bureaucratic proceedings, and they had to destroy the hardware anyway. anyway. Hey, it seems to me that they destroyed, over here, it seems to me that they destroyed every single chip that they could find. Was there any chip they did not, they did not touch? Um, they, they didn't destroy every single chip they could find, so if I go back to the keyboard controller, actually. Um, or even the motherboard. Yeah, One sec. Do you still recommend to use computers? If yes, which ones? Sorry? So you can see here, they... Um, they, in this trackpad, they only destroyed the chip highlighted in red, and they didn't destroy the chip highlighted in yellow and orange. So they, it seems to me that they only destroyed chips that could, had the capability to destroy information, and the CPU. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, there's, there's another one here which is very interesting, uh, which is actually on the motherboard of the, uh, the MacBook Air. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it from the photos, and I'm sorry if this is making you dizzy by going through this very, very fast. But there's actually a chip uh, down, if you see the white diagonal strip 
on the uh, the top left of the image. Just below that is, is what's called the Thunderbolt controller, and they didn't destroy that. So they were going after very, very specific chips and not just simply getting rid of everything. I hope that answers your question. Could we please go to stage right and please really eat the mic because it's raining and it's really hard to understand if you don't. So, uh, yes. So, um, yeah. Actually, I would like to go back to the question where you mentioned, you know, do we own our devices? So, mm -hmm. um, the thing is, everything on, in your computer is pretty much proprietary, it's closed source. Um, do you, like, would you actually support, like, you know, maybe people who need to uh, deal with sensitive information um, to, to use um, an open source device, um, you know, where people actually has gone through, designed it, uh, made it, uh, made, like, you know, the chips or the algorithms public, would you actually like, recommend them to do something like that or would you ask them to buy a cheaper computer, say a Raspberry Pi and a very, very cheap monitor? Yeah. Because, that's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable uh, recommending any laptop. Uh, there, is a, a, uh, there is the Novena laptop project which is you know. uh, trying to create an open source laptop. There's also Purism, which is creating the Libra N, uh, which is all but, I think, uh, the boot, some, there's a binary blob in the bootloader that they can't, Intel won't uh, release or allow them to release the source code for, but every other uh, chip, uh, the firmware for it is open source. Not to get too conspiratorial, but we're, we're, the supply chain is also um, a very, very interesting topic. We've seen the NSA infiltrating the supply chain of, say, Cisco routers to, to reflash things before they get to, to their, end, uh, their end user. And I'm not sure we could, at this point, recommend uh, an individual laptop or an individual device as one being more secure than any other one. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't know. Maybe there is somebody out there with knowledge about, so much knowledge about one particular laptop that they might be able to say is, is very, very good. There is the, um, the other one from, uh, what is it, the IBM uh, ThinkPad T60, which you can repurpose with pure free software from the Free Software Foundation as well. So that might be another avenue as well. But again, um, whether that's more secure or less secure or the, the components in there are, are okay, I, I simply can't make that call. Yeah, unfortunately, there doesn't really seem to be that many open source hardware uh, laptop solutions out there. And I definitely think there needs to be more, more of that because right now, when people buy a machine from, their, from a shop, it's essentially a black box that they're trusting with random chips and they're trusting their entire life with it. You know, and, and companies aren't being transparent about what, what exactly what's inside, what's inside that black box. In fact, they don't want you to, to reverse engineer it. And that's why when we email them, they, they refuse to tell us anything. And uh, I don't know if people were familiar with uh, Oracle's chief security officer who mentioned that she was not comfortable with people reverse engineering her products or their products to find bugs in it. So I'm not sure how uh, Dell or Apple or any of the, the hardware manufacturers would take the reverse engineering of them. I'm not saying that's a reason not to do it. I'm just saying that's what you may be up against in terms of trying to figure out um, and reverse engineer and find the faults in there. Yeah, I'd like to, um, I mean, share my opinion on that question. Like, do we own our devices? I think that we don't own anything we don't understand. So, yeah, but um, that's, those are very good points. I feel that, uh, well, if, in, in, like, um, if, if you really want to, say, make the destruction of you know computers um, a little bit easier. Maybe a Raspberry Pi hooked up to a monitor would be a better solution than they using your personal Mac. But yeah, possibly you may you, you, you may be right. Stage left, please. That's you. Okay, so you already mentioned that um, you at this point don't really know how how you would go about destroying a laptop. But since not everyone has an industrial class uh, grinder at home, um, what would be your 
basic recommendation giving the knowledge that you have right now, just to make it explicit? What, what would you do to a laptop if you had to destroy it with your current knowledge? So, with the current knowledge, what I would do is, if I absolutely had to get rid of a laptop, I would do what was done to the Terminator, seriously, thanks to Chris. Um, it would be in some, the entire thing, the motherboard, every single component would have gone into one of these industrial sized shredders, which are very expensive by the way, upwards of 2,000 pounds to buy one of these things. They will destroy a hard drive, they'll, they'll, they'll turn an entire hard drive into dust in about two minutes. So those might be the kind of steps. However, if you talk to people who, who do uh, threat modeling and risk for, for a living, um, Obviously, that might not be necessary uh, depending upon the information that you've had on the laptop and that might be extreme. However, I think your question might be if you were a, a, a source that had information and absolutely had to get rid of it, uh, maybe this is the option because the kind of people who are going to be in the prosecution uh, against you are going to be the people who have the technical capabilities and resources to potentially be able to recover as much information as possible from these chips and without the manufacturers being honest with us and transparent with us about what they do um, it's very very difficult for us not to simply just give the advice of drop it into uh, an industrial size shredder and make sure everything is all the bits that come out are less than two millimeters I would say that that was one of the, the theories that I advanced in the previous talk we gave and somebody made a very valid point that, not, not with Apple, because I, think, I don't think they use this, but some of the motherboards, if you turn them to dust, the dust may actually be toxic. So I would just give that as, a, as a, a, another um, factor that you might consider in terms of whether you actually do it or not. Okay, the last question is also coming from the left, I think. Uh, hey, have you seen the good BIOS talk at the 30C3? It's from the main maintainer of Coreboot, some open source uh, BIOS replacement firmware. Um, he went through all his uh, laptop schematics and picked out what each chip is doing. And mm, uh, this is. Oh, I, haven't, moment, I, I haven't seen it myself, but that sounds interesting. So I think I'll watch that. This is Coreboot? Yeah. yeah. Coreboot. Core yeah. But it's, so it, it, the, the, some of the bootloaders, as I understand it, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, still rely on certain binary blobs. There is a binary blob, yes. But he went through which chip is connecting to where and which chip could have access to the main memory and all the things which are really important. He also pointed out which uh, pins you could disconnect so these chips won't have access to the memory, as far as I remember. And was that for a specific uh, model? For the ThinkPad X60. Gotcha. So it's a core to do a processor, and you can work on this device, but you need to have lots of technical knowledge to use it. Great. Appreciate that. OK, thank you. That concludes the talk for today. So please, once again, thank our speakers, Mustafa and Richard.